that God made that was too big for him to move. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter number 18, familiar passage of Scripture. I told you this morning, uh, you get the side effect. It's like you take medicine, and they tell you that the medicine is going to help make you well, but each medicine comes with side effects. And it uh, depends on whether or not you want to endure the side effects as to whether or not you want to take the medicine. And then it boils down, do you want to get better or you just want to <laughs> go ahead and die without side effects? And you get the side effect of, while wow, the Lord's working on me, uh, I'm not one to keep it to myself. I figure He's working on me for something. And so as a result, you got some of what you got in Sunday school and going to have it again here this morning. I want to get, I want to be better. I want to be a better Christian. I want to be more pleasing. I want to be uh, more. I don't want to just be uh, doing it out of responsibility or duty. Uh, I don't want to be duty bound. I want to be relationship bound. Yes, amen. Amen. And uh, one of the things that's difficult is, is that once we get ourselves in a certain position, we sort of take ourselves off the wheel. And we say, well, I'm already where I believe I need to be, and so I'm no longer in this passage doesn't fit to me anymore. But the question would be is, is can God do whatever he wants to do with you? Right. Yeah. I mean, is it right for the clay to say to the potter, I don't want you to do this? The clay doesn't speak to the potter. Nope. Right. So I'll just point out a few things for you this morning, and I'll try not to be too vehement with it. But I, I do want to say this. We've lost the have thine own way right. mentality in church today. It's I'm going to have my way, and then I expect the church, I expect the people, and most of all, I expect God to conform to how I've already got it drawn up. God could take any one of us right now and take us out. And stop your heart beating, stop your lungs from breathing. He could literally uh, cripple you, and put you in a wheelchair, or allow it to happen, and put you in a hospital bed. And everything you're planning for the years to come all comes down to the fact that you're not even going to be here for years to come. You're making plans as if, you know, well, sometimes those plans don't include the Lord. I remember a lot of years ago, it's been a bunch of years, we were in the second old building over there when the Lord dealt with me about South Africa. And again, I'm not the poster child for having all this down pat. But what he was checking was my pliability. Uh, now that I'm where I'm supposed to be and I'm pastoring the church and I'd left downtown and so on and so forth, uh, you know, and I go back from South Africa and we had a great trip there, or I felt we did. And the Lord really tagged my heart, whether he did the hearts of anybody else or not, the Lord really tagged my heart. To the point when we're flying back, my wife said to me, she said, are we moving? And I said, I don't, I don't know. I didn't say no. I was like, I'm, I'm not sure because something was going on. And I remember pulling out of that uh, airport there, pulling away from the jetway, and I remember crying and stuff, and somebody had fixed it, and we had three seats there, and we swap off and get a little nap in between things and all when we were flying back on that long trip. And I remember the whole time I'm laying there, when I wasn't asleep, I was praying, and the Lord began to deal with me, and I thought he was going to call me to go to South Africa. And I, be honest with you, I, I wasn't right off the bat like, oh, okay, Lord, no problem. That's what you want me to do. We'll, you know, we'll go through what we went through before and sell everything and <laughs> we'll take off. I mean, by that time, I'd fallen in love with you people. And by that time, I was fully committed to you people. And I'm like, Lord, I'm a pastor and I'm, I'm, I'm here and this is where I believe you want me to be and this is what I want you to do and, and so on and so forth. And the Lord said, uh, uh, South Africa. And so I finally surrendered and I said, okay, Lord, if that's what you want me to do. And I, I put out some hurdles and stuff like that and I said, okay, Lord, I'm willing. You just make it plain. I don't want to make a mess, but if that's what you want me to do, uh, we'll go. And uh, about three weeks later, I was walking in the side over there out past my office and I walked down the side. I remember it like it was yesterday. I stopped and the Lord said, hey, not audibly. And I said, yes, sir. And I thought, here it comes. <laughs> here comes the confirmation. He said, about South Africa. I said, yes, sir, I told you, I'll go. You want me to resign today? That's what I thought he wanted me to do. And he said, no, just checking. <laughs> just like that. He sounded a lot like the old preacher. <laughs> God can sound like that sometimes. Sometimes God sounds like my dad, and sometimes he sounds like Lentz, and sometimes he sounds like the old preacher. And I said, yes, sir, I told you, I'll go. You want me to resign today? I hadn't even talked to her. I hadn't even told her I was going to do that. I didn't know. Because the Lord's dealing with me. He's not dealing with me and her. He's dealing with me. And so I'm getting ready. I was okay, Lord, if you want me to do it, I'll go ahead and pull the plug today and we'll get things moving and do the, the whole nine yards and you'll have to equip me for it. I don't know much about it. And he said, okay, just checking. 
And I got up and preached. But you know what? That happened years after I'd been doing what I was doing. You know what God was checking? To see whether or not I'd be willing to do what He wanted me to do. But I'd gotten comfortable doing what I was doing. I'd gotten accustomed to the routine duty. Preparing four messages a week and doing school stuff and doing all those things. I had sort of settled into the proverbial traces. And plowing became kind of easy for me because I, my strength had gotten to the point I was used to the weight. I hadn't added anything. And when he hit me with that, you know what I realized? The problem was my dirt was hard and I, was, I had gotten off the wheel. I had already decided God didn't need to do no more work on me. <laughs> Lord, I'll give my place up on the wheel and let somebody else get on there. Notice what the passage says here, and we'll let you have a seat here in just one second. And first, uh, and then uh, Jeremiah, first Jeremiah, <laughs> in Jeremiah, chapter number eighteen, the Lord which came to Jeremiah. Now it's not like Elijah. Elijah gets called out. You don't know anything about his calling or anything. Elijah just shows up there and tells uh, the king what to do and so on and so forth. And you make the the assumption it's implied that God had already told him what to say. And then followed up when that prophet spoke what he said was going to happen so you knew he was ordained by God. In this case, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house and there will I cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house and behold he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make it. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Brother Larry, pray for us, would you please? Father, we come to you this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus. And uh, we want to thank you, Lord, that uh, you give us a pastor, a preacher here, mm -hmm. that... Uh, it does have the desire and does his best to be lined up and to do your will. Amen. Not just in his life, but for messages for us. Yes. yes. And Lord, what we've heard even this day in the past hour and a half is you're dealing with him just like you deal with us. Yes. He's not above that. And his desire is to be better. Yes. And Lord, I hope that our desire is to be better. Right. I pray yes. God for, and thank you, God, for these messages on this soil and the ground, and the ground work. And Lord, and what I'm hearing is uh, that Larry needs a lot of work and probably many, many others. Lord, in this preparation deal, God, that we might not think that we have the choosing of what seed will be planted or what we'll be used for, but Lord, our desire would be just to be used and that Your will might be done in our life and that our soul will be ready. Now we hear we're talking about the clay on the wheel. The clay will be similar to that soil. God in a surrendering factor. I pray this morning for this message, God, that He's going to give us, that You're going to give us through Him. Lord, that we would, if we had a plant of white flag up, that we would hold it high. Yes. Uh, Lord, to You and that You would deal with us through Your Word. I thank You for that. I know that's how You deal with us. Not necessarily speaking to us all the but in our reading and in our prayer. So our prayer this morning would be that you'd use your man to preach to us, give us the Word, and help us to be, if we're not aligned, to get more so in line with you. And help our desire to be greater, to do something for you, and Lord, to be better. We're going to give you all the glory for what we're going to hear. I want to thank you, Lord, for the visitors and all those that are here that have come in. Amen. Yep. And for the folks that come regular as well. Those that are listening by way of the airwaves, which we were there one day. And you use that too. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. Thank you for standing. I find a lot of things here. First of all, I want to say this to you. For those of you that are Bible believers, you know doctrinally where the passage fits. It's the Lord speaking to the nation of Israel. But as many a great preacher has pointed out to you before, and I hope you've learned at least this much from me, that there's also always a practical application of a doctrinal truth that's in the Bible. You can't just throw out the whole Bible just because it's not in the Pauline epistles. 
you have to be willing to look at those things and say, is there something that I can learn from a practical standpoint that will draw me closer to the Lord, that will increase my spiritual life? One of the problems with us as Bible believers is, is because most of us have read our Bible more than one time through, and most of us have heard preaching from great, great preachers that have preached on all the cherry-picked passages out of the Bible, and we think there's nothing new in the passage. So we'll have a tendency when we hit that spot in our preaching or in our, in our, our uh, reading that we just kind of buzz through it and we maybe remember part of a message that was there, but we don't pause for a minute and go, wait a minute, you know, maybe there's something else in here for me or maybe there's a time in my life right now where I happen to hit this passage. Now, I happen to be going through some things about growing. I happen to be going through some things about soil. I happen to be going through things about seed, about going through things about fellowship and stuff. It started uh, two weeks or so before camp, and it hasn't quit yet. I have been, uh, the Lord has been plowing my proverbial taters. Uh, I, I have maybe, uh, I know some of you think that I'm just tired and I'm worn out and because of her being sick and all that kind of stuff, that's not it at all. My countenance may not have been real lifted up because the Lord's plowing my taters. I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm not doing anything immoral. I don't want you to get the wrong impression, but the Lord's working on me. Uh, and I can tell I'm still alive because I'm screaming like a little girl, man. I mean, I'm, I'm hollering. Uh, what he's doing with me right now is not fun, and uh, I am not enjoying it in the least. And I realize right off the bat I have a, a lack of an affinity, a lack of an appreciation for when the Lord decides to pull me out of the crowd, I like it when he pulls me out of the crowd and recognizes me. I don't like it when he pulls me out of the crowd and has one of those little private come to Jesus meetings and just me and him, and it's behind the woodshed. And he pulls me out there and then he has some uh, words to say to me. Now, you may be different. Oh, well, any fellowship with the Lord is good fellowship. I'm disappointed that, he's, that I put him in a position where he has to plow my taters. I should have learned lessons from his words a long time ago. If I'd have learned the lessons from the words and the seed had found the good ground, then I wouldn't be going through what I'm going through right now. But I'm telling you up front, it's a personal testimony. It may not make good preaching, but it does help you to understand uh, why I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm serious as a sack full of rattlesnakes right now. You say, why? I'm in the press. Amen. Don't worry, I'm not pulling the plug. I don't know who you've talked to or what you've heard. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here until the Lord kills me, until I'm so old that I can't find my place in the Bible. And if you can't hold me up here with Aaron and her on both sides, but until that time, I'm not planning on this. So this, so this isn't that. I'm not getting called to, to South Africa or somewhere else or nothing. I'm not going with the soon-to-be skeletons down to Australia. He's got a church down there. We've got another brother down there that's got a church. They don't need me down there. I'm here. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is I'm back on the wheel. And the Lord's looking at a marred vessel in this passage right here. And I want to point out just a couple of things that I believe would be helpful or beneficial. It certainly is to me. First of all, the passage says right there, arise. Mm -hmm. You say, why? Because as a Christian, we have a tendency to get comfortable. Amen. We have a tendency to set a spell. We set so long that before long, we get stove up. I've recognized this. As I've gotten older, I've recognized that I, I must have some kind of arthritis or something. I must, something must be going on. I can sit for a short period of time and I get up, man, I sound like a box of Rice Krispies when I start walking and I'm kind of like, oh my goodness, man, and I'm half bent over. and I'm Now once I get up and get moving, I'm doing pretty good. It's like, yeah, but I found myself spiritually in the same situation. See, I'm comfortable reading, studying, praying. I'm comfortable praying messages. I'm comfortable traveling. I'm comfortable uh, preaching to other people. I'm comfortable with you as a conversation, uh, as a congregation. I I'm, I'm comfortable doing what I'm doing. I like doing what I'm doing. Uh, that's not where the problem is. The problem is it's so comfortable, I've done slumped down into that easy chair. I already have slumped down in that easy chair. I've gotten comfortable. And then when the Lord said, arise, it's kind of like it's taking more of an act of Congress. Arise, get off your dead behind, go to the altar, boy. How long has it been since you've been to one? I had an old preacher last night. He's about 20 years older than me. He called me and he was talking about the altar and talking about things about the altar. And I was like, Lord, is that what you want me to preach on tomorrow? And he went through some of the points that I made about one of those things. And he said, you know something, preacher, I've recognized. He said, now I'm a little older than you. Said, yeah, you think? He's about 10. I said 20. He's about 10, about 15 years older than me. And I said, uh, what's that, preacher? And he said, you know, used to back in the day, people went to the altar all the time. And he said, nowadays even preachers don't go to the altar. 
He said, reckon why that is. I said, I reckon they feel like they have nothing to give anymore. They've already gave it all, I guess, preacher. I don't know. Maybe they already feel like they're perfect just like they are. And he said, well, I, I still go to the altar. And he said, people ask all the time, why are you still going to the altar? And I tell them, it's none of their business because God's still working on me. Amen. And I said, I'll see you at the altar in the morning. <laughs> <clears throat> you say, why? Arise. It's hard to get up from your comfort zone. Yes. God's been good to us, hasn't he? Yes, uh, I mean, we kind of take things for granted. I mean, but if, if, if just the slightest little wrinkle, crinkle, whatever comes in our life, all of a sudden, man, we, we're like nervous Nelly. Everything comes off the rails because everything wasn't just the way it ought to be. I like the simplicity of it's time to rise and go back to Bethel. It's time to arise and go to the house of God. It's time to arise and go down to the potter's house. It's time to get up off your comfortable behind your hind end, your backside, your posterior, your buttock, but, buttocks, and it's time to get up and go down. Amen. Amen. Don't you find that strange? Get up, but go down. The second thing I'd like to say is right there in that passage is, is that if you're going to do what God wants you to do, it's going to be a downward spiral from an upward position. It's going to be a downward spiral from an upward position. In order for you to find out what God wants you to do on the wheel, you've got to go down to the potter's house. Now, I know what First Chronicles said around chapter 4 or 5 there. Uh, Left-hand page, right-hand column up at the top in an old Schofield Bible. He talks about the potter's house being close to the king's house. And there's a reason for that, I guess, because the king must bust a lot of dishes and, and need a lot of dishes or he has a lot of guests coming over. And so you would think probably in the old days the kings would have more need for a potter than normal people would because of the amount of people they have coming on a regular basis. Is that a fair statement? So it's close enough to the king's house. And guess what happens? He said, arise and go down. Well, the most difficult thing to do is, is to recognize I'm not talking about putting yourself down. I'm talking about about being willing to be humble. David said in Psalm 51, broken in a contrite heart. You saw that passage this morning, broken, Isaiah 57, and contrite. I dwell with those that are broken and contrite. When he gets down there to the potter's house, he sits there, the Bible said, he beheld, he looked at, he saw on the wheel a vessel, a clay, marred in the hand of the potter. That clay is sitting up there and say, what's happening to it? That clay's got some stiff spots in it. That clay's got some hard spots in it. That clay's got some impurities in it, some imperfections in it. It's got some contamination in it. It's got some straw. It's got some weeds. It's got some things that if you put it together and then put it in the kiln to be able to get it hot where it'll be hard, those things will always be a place that will be suspect to break under pressure. And he begins to work on that. And he says, it's marred in the hand of the potter. And can I say this to you? Sometimes what they do is, is that vessel is up there on the pot and, and we think we know what that vessel is going to be. We think we know exactly how that vessel is going to turn out. I got the passages listed here, but I don't want to take the time to run through them all. But I'd like for you to listen to me, if you will. We've gotten into the place where we're not just the clay, we are the potter. And we're making a decision, God, I'm the clay, but I'm going to tell you how it is you're going to use me and what it is you're going to do with me and the way you're going to do it with me and when you're going to do it with me. And the passages in the Bible said, shall the clay say to the potter? Look, if you will, in Romans chapter number 9, real quick, let me just give you a couple of these things because it's important uh, for you to realize because he's fixing to say something to you and I believe it's a moment of surrender. Can I just have your attention for a few minutes? This is really important. Can you set aside your politics and your preferences and your anger and your mad and, and all that and he's talking to me. Can you just set all of that aside for a minute? Because ultimately when you got saved, you know what God wants to do? He wants to make you a vessel that's pleasing to Him. Not pleasing necessarily to me and you, pleasing to Him. We've stopped doing that. Nowadays we're pleasing to the world and we're pleasing to the flesh and we're pleasing to the devil and we're pleasing to the people and we're pleasing to everybody. There's just this sort of level of kind of, I don't know, sort of lackadaisical carnality running through even Bible-believing independent King James-only Baptist churches. 
There's a thread starting to work its way through and modern theology has begun because we forgot, wait a minute, he's supposed to make us as a giant vessel into a vessel that's pleasing to him, not pleasing to us and not pleasing to anyone else. And in order to do that, he said, arise, go to the potter's house and I'll give you my what? Words. Bible preaching still reigns supreme in God's eyes. The purpose for church, as I said to you in Sunday school, is preaching and teaching the Word of God. It's not all the stuff everybody else is doing. I realize it is popular now for everybody else to do all they're doing. It's not biblical, but it's popular. Well, preacher, that's how you reach them. No, no. You reach them with preaching or you don't reach them. You reach them with teaching the Word of God or you don't reach them. You don't change your music to grab a bunch of musicians so you can fill up the orchestra. You use the individuals that are faithful enough here. Hey, there's a lot of times only one or two would be up here playing. We're not looking to fill up an orchestra or pay somebody for optics so that when they shine on the camera thing up there, oh look, they got a big orchestra, all this kind of stuff. We only sing a couple of congregationals anyway. Right. You say, why? Well, because we're ready to get to preaching. And if we sing more than that, you're going to be out of here at 2 o'clock instead of 1. <laughs> but we've gotten out of the mindset that we're here to be pleasing to God. We're not here to be pleasing to everybody else. I can assure you that the majority of the disagreements that you have with each other is that one or both of you are trying your best to please yourself, not be pleasing to God. Once you become pleasing to God, it's kind of like, hey, I'm in His hands. He can do with me whatever He wants to do. But there comes a big question. How often are you mandating or dictating to him what he should do with you? Do you realize the situation you are in right now, most times the clay mars itself and has to be remade. Because the clay has decided to become also the potter and decided when and if and how the potter should put him on the wheel and how the potter should spin the wheel and how often he should spin it and how fast he should spin it or how slow he should spin it and we've decided how it's going to be and we have now mandated, listen, this is what's going on. I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to get this done, I got to get that, I got to get that. And you know what? You may be on the wheel and the potter's like, yeah, I'm in slow-mo right now. Every vessel can be used of God, but every vessel is not used the same way. Maybe right now you're just in a shelf right now waiting for the time when the Lord said, okay, now's the time. But until then, can you be patient or are you always jumping off the shelf? I can't answer for you. You see somebody else doing it, you think, oh, I should be done. No, wait a minute. I told you this morning in Sunday school, timing is as important as knowing what you're supposed to do. You can do the right thing, but do it at the wrong time or try to force God's hand. You know what you did? You just jumped off the wheel and you decided, I'm now ready. Said who? You said it. Or like Absalom, hey, everybody around you said it. Well, Absalom, you must be ready. Well, Absalom, you must be ready. Absalom, your daddy's not treating you right. Absalom, you must be the guy. I mean, you've been in the gate kissing them and taking, making time with them and, and talking to them and taking them out to dinner. Of course, you had somebody kind of get killed there. Tell, oh, that was your brother. That's not a big deal. Go ahead and kill your brother at dinner. Did you get the inference? You sit down to dinner and you kill your brother. And then before long, you're elevated to the throne. Well, you know what the end of the story is. You say, what happened? It's a timing thing. Well, why didn't David do this and why didn't David do that? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say why. Maybe David knew some things that you and I don't know based on other decisions that David made. Maybe there was a reason that David had withdrawn himself from his son. And maybe David, you can't say he didn't love him because he pined pined after him after he was gone. So much so that even Joab said he could tell that David's heart was after Joab. I mean after Absalom. Well, why didn't he do this and why didn't he do that? I don't know. Why are you asking that question? Like David did something wrong. Did you ever pause to think for just a minute? Maybe it was fine to find out whether or not that boy, instead of burning somebody's field down and forcing Joab's hand to make David take a meeting, that maybe uh, that Absalom should have humbled himself and cut his hair and gone in and said, uh, uh, Daddy, can I talk to you for a minute? Yes. Right. Yes. 
You say what? When it finally took place and was orchestrated, David did his best to make things right and Absalom never changed. He went down there in the next passage and turned around. You know what he's doing? He's catching all the people coming in and out of Jerusalem and he's saying, hey, I got you. I got you. I can help you. I can take care of you. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's how it's going to be. Here's how things will go. Well, if I was just the king, this is what I would do. I'd take care of you. To the point that you know what he did? He sent spies into the land and he said, when you hear the horn blow, know that I'm going to take over and then rise up and come in there and do it. And David said, see you later. You say, what is that? A picture of a vessel that's decided, I'm ready now. I don't know if you're ready or not. I can't tell you. I'm ready to get married. Are you sure? I mean, you're looking at the here and now. You're looking at the right now. You think, if I don't get married right now, I'm never going to get married. Maybe you shouldn't be married. Maybe right now you shouldn't be married. Maybe you should finish school. Maybe you should work on your job. Maybe you should do whatever else that might be. But then there's this pressure to always do or be something somebody else wants you to do or be. And guess what happens? All of a sudden, before long, you're running off on your ego only. And before long, you don't even realize you done jumped off. And guess what happens? You make a mess and then you get marred. Look in Romans chapter number 9. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 9, pick it up in verse 20. Nay, but old man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of some lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Somebody said, I don't want to be a vessel under dishonor. See, but you take that in a different kind of a manner. A dishonorable vessel just simply means something that's used to take out the garbage or something that's used to take out uh, the, 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 the uh, discards in the bathroom and, and those kind of things or to take the trash out. It's a dishonorable vessel, but it's still being used. I can assure you that you would rather have the honorable position and that would be great for you to be the teapot sitting there or even the plate on the china and so on and so forth. But I guarantee you this, those dishonorable vessels sure are appreciated when it comes time to carry out the garbage and flush the toilet. Amen. When it comes to washing the dishes and taking care of the nursery. Amen. When it comes to dirty diapers and, and wiping up those kind of things. You say, what is that? Oh, they may not be a vessel unto honor. When was the last time you honored nursery workers or Sunday school teachers? Right. I mean, you give attention to the preacher. Oh, preacher, we love you. We appreciate you. And, and thank you for all that. You know, you're a vessel unto honor. Well, when's the last time? What about all the other elbow grease being done? Amen. What about all the other individuals? You say, what is that? Well, they may not be vessels unto honor as you see them. And it may be considered that. But without those things, this place would stink. Without those things that were here, ladies and gentlemen, being willing to accept a position beneath what maybe they're even capable of doing but nevertheless doing what God would have them to do. Come back to the book of Jeremiah. I think I've already lost you. I have to say this because it's important. We have a, just a, a, a couple people that uh, sometimes join us online, so I, gotta, I have to say this because they may not be Bible believers. And they don't know and understand that when they go to church, verse number 2 that they're going to hear His words. You live in a day and time where when people go to church, they expect to vote. They expect to have help for their marriage, a divorcee class. They expect to have aerobics classes, dietary classes. You know what's been happening even in independent Baptist churches? Uh, we have a, a guy that's very, very well known. And so instead of having a church service, we have a guy that... Uh, he's put up on a video screen and he gives you how to get out of debt and how to pay your mortgage off for church. You say, was that anything wrong with that? Do it at home. Right. Right. You're going to tell me that's more important than the Word of God? Well, you know, the Bible says, oh, no man anything. Wait, 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 wait. If I'm paying my bills, I don't owe any man anything. I'm keeping the contract. Right. You have a misconception of that. There's probably very few of you in here that own a home or own a car that have not at one time had to borrow money in order to obtain it. Well, you violated Scripture according to most people because you went out and the very people that are teaching it did the exact same thing until they were well enough off to be able to pay everything off. That is not how life begins. 
I wish you had enough left over to be able to build a savings account and then be able to do it. But the truth of the matter is you live in a different economic time and I'm not an economist or any of that. But you live in a different time that if you want to be able to get ahead, now they're going to get you to balloon and, and do all this other stuff. But if you want to get ahead, guess what? You've got to sign a contract. Make sure it's within your means. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But the very idea of teaching that in a church setting. You say, but preacher, listen, we get calls here all the time. Hey, you got a building, you got this building over here, and we'd like to have this class, we'd like to have that class, we'd like to use it for voter registration, we'd like to use it for this school class, we'd like to use it for this, we'd like to use that. No, thank you. Well, we're willing to pay the rent and so on and so forth. Thank you. No. You say, what? Well, this is God's house. Amen. This is not a business. Amen. We do business, but you need to understand this is God's house. This is the potter's house. There's a preacher somewhere that actually had the name of that church. I thought Potter's House Baptist Church would be good, but the problem is if I had to do the sign, I'd have to show a bunch of Christians jumping off the wheel all the time, you know, getting, getting slung off the wheel because they don't like it and that kind of thing. But you say, what is it? This is God's house. And you want to do your business, do it outside the door. You know, one of the things that the Lord got upset about the Lord walked into the temple, remember? And they're in there and the money changers there. The money changers are there. The money changers are there. You remember that. Don't be offended by that. I'm not taking up an offering. But the money changers are there. You know what the Lord does? He turns the table over, makes a whip and drives them out. He said, you've made my father's house of prayer into a what? Modern theology is, is that that's okay. We got a big building, so let's use it for recreational. And let's use it for contemporary. Let's use it for political. Let's use it for anything. No, it's God's house. You say, what does it do? When we're not in here preaching, it's in here being prayed for. Amen. It's not a business. It's not a thing where we come in and we do other stuff. It brings a spirit with it. Right. Yes, do all that stuff at your house. Do it in your business. Yes. But why do we bring the business into the church? I don't understand that. Are you that hard up that you have to do business with just the people in the church? Come on, preacher. If you're playing... Why don't you go get your own business? Right. Amen. I mean, you go up to Walmart and some of you get bent out of shape because you're standing blocking their door and standing in the parking lot preaching. They paid thousands and millions of dollars in advertising to draw people. Why are you using their nickel? Was your God a cheap God? Right. Stand out on the street corner and public preach. Yeah. You use them. We're, well, Walmart's having a big sale today, so we're going to the Walmart parking lot. And then you get upset when the police get called. Hey, well, how would you feel if somebody pulled in your blessed driveway and just started preaching uh, out of the Koran? Come on. Make a play. You'd be on the phone. I can tell you what some of you would say, because you've already said it. Do you know who I know? You know who's a member of my church? <laughs> Got his private number right here. Help me, Jesus. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Could I get a witness? Can I say this? And get, be upset if you want to be, okay? But let me just say this. He's still who he was when he comes to church. Amen. He hasn't changed that. that. It has not changed him, and he hasn't changed that. So, so stop using that like all of a sudden. Oh, yeah, now we got an end now. You better just be praying and ask God to help him. But I got to move on. Can I say this for those of you listening? Certainly nobody here. I'm positive of that. But for those of you that are listening out there in the wide, wide world, when you go to church, it's supposed to be about the Word. It's not supposed to be about the music and the music program and what you got for me to do this and to do that. It's not supposed to be a hand-me-down, help-me-out kind of a deal. I'm supposed to help you by preaching the Word. You're not supposed to come down here for any other reason. Yeah, but preacher, we can stop the butts. Now listen, I've gotten old and I've gotten stubborn, but when it comes to that, I'm like a tree planted by the water. I'm not going to be moved. Amen. The first second that I think we're like upbeating things too much and bringing things along too fast, I can assure you I know how to slow it down. And get too contemporary in your worship. We're supposed to be here to be gathered for the Word. I know this about that. Sheep need the right kind of food. And the only right kind of food is out of this Bible. Yes. That's a King James Bible. Yes. The other stuff's got mildew and mold in it. And when you, eat it, when you eat it, you're going to get colic. For some of you that know what that is. All right, notice what he says. He said, arise and go down to the potter's house and hear my words. I'll cause thee to hear my words. Almost like if there's something, if you're not willing to come down to get it, he ain't giving it. But I got to move on. 
I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the, on the wheels. And the vessel he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. I wonder if Moses would have given up after 40 years. He got pretty marred, didn't he? Mm -hmm. yes, sir. And the Lord let him spend 40 years on the backside of the desert before he called him back out. And there's no indication that he had told Moses when he left to go over there the first time, hey, I'll call you back in 40 years. Moses thought he was done. Peter thought he was done. He's out in the fishing boat. I want to encourage you this morning. God's not done with you till you're dead. But here's the hard part. You've got to be willing to get up on the wheel. You've got to be willing to let the marred vessel get up there and let the hands of the parter, the nail-scarred hands, the nail-pierced hands, you've got to be willing to let him squeeze you and work out those hard places and those difficult places and those lumps and those bumps. And you have to be willing to let him take that thing that you thought was going to be a cup or a teapot or whatever you like as your method of service or whatever it might be and you have to let him mash it down and start all over again. He said and form a new work. The new work doesn't it resemble the old work at all. Would you be willing to let God do that today? I mean, if you had God's hand on you. You see, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of times what he does is, is for me, he allowed me to do something I dearly love. By the time I was 19 years of age, it's just a personal testimony. I, the Lord allowed me to be a policeman. I'd been doing it since I was 17. They signed a special waiver, let me ride as a civilian observer. The day I turned 18, my parents signed, allowed me to get a gun. I started riding as a reserve officer. By the time I was 19, I graduated from the first academy I went to. I must have been a slow learner because I had to go back through later on. But they put me to work on the midnight shift when I got out of that. And I worked my way to where I wanted to be and then had to go back down and do all these things. And you say, well, what was that? I thought I was done. I had the desires of my heart. And I had her to go along with it. And I'm kind of like, man, this is pretty good. <laughs> I'm liking this. I'm doing what I like every day and I come home to what I like every day. This is, this is a pretty good deal. And then the Lord said, I want you to preach. And I said, okay, well, ain't no problem. I'd preach a youth camp here and there, and I'd preach a Sunday school class and teach a little bit and do a little Bible study. And, and the Lord said, well, you know, you got an issue with the Bible, and we get through dealing with the issues with the Bible and visiting all over, and I'm going to work. And the people that were with us at the time, they went to 17 or 18 different churches at the time and, and all that, <coughs> and we couldn't find it. And the Lord said, hey, just start one in the living room. And so I'm like, well, okay, I can start it on the living room and then we'll visit around the Sunday nights and so on and so forth and until we get the guy and I'll be glad to help him any way I can. But I'm a policeman. Come on. Starting to work on me. Marred. He said, well, I appreciate that. And then before long, very long story short, we're over here and we're here for about 10 years and I'm starting to count my vacation days and starting to count my time around and I'm starting to figure out, okay, I can probably get retirement and still be able to get, uh, you know, a pretty decent income there and I can not have to depend on anybody and not have to, de to depend on the church. And the church will probably remain small and, you know, that kind of a deal. And I had it all figured out. And the Lord said, I'd like for you to go now. And I said, well, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> See, I was my own vessel. I had already decided how I was going to finish out. And once I got where I wanted to get, then I would be able to be secure and taken care of, not have to depend on the people. I decided how it was going to turn out. And the Lord said, um, I have you leave now. I said, Lord, uh, with my time and everything else, I don't like but about two years, maybe two and a quarter years, I, I can make that and then I can have this and this and this and this. He said, hey, you big old lion in the pulpit. <clears throat> Let me take away that steady income from you and see if you still bark as loud as you bark and growl as loud as you growl. You big old tough guy standing on the fountain down there in the parkway, let's take away the fact that you don't have a gold badge to get you out of that anymore. You get in and out of prisons, you just get the professional courtesy because of that. How about I take all that away and you know what you are? You ain't nothing but a preacher and you have to depend on me to take care of you and to feed you. Amen. 
Well, now, Lord, see, the way I got this thing, now, you started off molding me, and I, you let me get the desires of my heart, and you let me be a policeman, and, and you've let me do this and let me do that, and you seem to have taken care of me pretty well in spite of my stupidity and idiocy and, and those kind of things like that. Now, uh, the Lord, well, the way I got it figured out, yeah, you become petrified. You're not pliable at all. Can I not do with you as it pleases me? Well, sure you can, Lord, but um, could you give it a couple years? <laughs> now, I know you wouldn't be that way. <sighs> but I was. Come on, and the Lord said, uh, I said, okay, when? He said, April the 2nd. Just like that. I said, okay, Lord, let me just make sure now. I know it's not my, my flesh. <laughs> and I know everybody thinks I'm crazy. But I'm afraid it might be the devil. I don't want to mess up my testimony. and give you a couple of things here to consider. And if you could take care of those things. I didn't tell anybody what it was. And you take care of those things. And I'm willing, but I'm, I'm waiting. It wasn't 60 days. All three of them done. Amen. And the Lord said, you're moved. You say, what would he have done? I could have stayed on there. I could have stayed right there and did what I did. Continued to be bivocational or whatever and, and then later on retire and then maybe still go into pastor. But that's not what he wanted. Amen. What he said was now. Yeah. What would have happened? Ask him at the judgment seat. I don't know. Maybe if I'd have stayed down there, I'd have gotten killed. Maybe if I'd have stayed down there, I'd have died from a heart attack or a stroke. Maybe if I'd have stayed down there, I would have walked away from the ministry. Maybe I don't know. I can't answer the question. I just know for me. I'm not saying for you. I just know for me. He checked my pliability. I was petrified. Amen. Stiff, stout. Preacher before, or policeman before preacher. Preacher before Pastor. See, what was that? Just a personal testimony. I actually knew a lot of people down there. They actually liked me, some of them. When I got ready to do that, they were like, get, a, get the big dog coming, coming down, not going up. Big dog come down, sit down. Are you okay? Yes, sir. Are you sure? I mean, we know you're a preacher and everything, but this is a little extreme. <laughs> Like a little nuts, or you, you you need a sabbatical? Exact words. You need a sabbatical? You have, you got enough leave time, or if not, we'll we'll. No, sir. I'm I'm fine. I'm very much aware of what I'm doing, and I appreciate your concern and appreciate your kindness. But no, sir. I'm sure that you, well. Now you know people get religious convictions. We don't want to get carried away with this thing here. And you know I'm I'm I, I mean I go to church too, and I, under, I yes, sir. I understand. I really appreciate it. I just know what I was told to do. You say, what was he checking? Pliability. Guess what classroom I'm in right now? <laughs> See, oftentimes we think once we graduate from it, we never have to repeat the grade. Yes, sir. Come on, preacher. I told you in Sunday school, if you were brave enough and bold enough to sit through it like a Star Trek adventure, bravely and boldly go to no planet we've ever been before. <laughs> I told you today, he is plowing my taters. I don't know if he's plowing yours or not. He's plowing mine. Amen. I'm very selfish when it comes to that. I wish I could get up here and scream and holler this whole passage at you. I'm sitting on the wheel right now. Uh, the clay's kind of quiet. I don't know what he's going to do. And he said, you know, I, I appreciate that, but your marring is, is that you've become petrified. You're not pliable anymore. Lord, I'm witnessing. I'm pastoring a church on the side, and I'm taking mission trips and going with Brother Lentz other places, and I'm doing all these other things. Yeah, but you're still holding on to something I want you to turn loose of. You got a hold of the horns of the altar, you're grabbing that security blanket, boy. And you get up there and preach like a stinking wild man, but you don't have to worry about them. You haven't taken any money from the church at all for years, 10 years. And the church was so broke we couldn't even pay attention. Matter of fact, when I left, he'll tell you, and he came just a little after that, when I left, the church was able to give me all they could give me was $1,000 a month. And that was a stretch. My mortgage was more than that. The Lord said, let's go. <coughs> 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 
See, you look back now and you're like, oh, I guess it worked out okay. Oh, I got news for you. There was a lot of sleepless nights. God used certain people to do things and to help along the way that God touched their hearts and helped us and we never missed a meal. I'm going to go ahead and let you in on an inside straight that you probably don't know anything about. That old preacher over there found out what I did and he went to his mission board and they sent me money every month until I finally got where I could get on my own. The only stipulation was is when you get where you're on your own then you send it and I'll send it to somebody else. He never said a word to anybody. You say, why are you so attached to that place over there? That place took care of me, took care of her, and took care of us because they filled in and saw a broken down old vessel. You say, what, just an old man? Never said a word about going. Found out I'd gone, I never said a word to him. Next thing I know, here's a to my home address. Here's a check. I think, well, that's really nice. Next month, here's a check. Hey, preacher? Yeah, man. <laughs> What's up, Captain? I said, uh, uh, I, I don't, there must be a mistake or something. I'm getting a check from the mission board over there. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> that's called home missions, brother. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's called home missions. We're supporting your work. Oh, My God Amen. shall supply Amen. all your needs through His riches in glory. Amen. I, I haven't told some of you this. You don't know. You're thinking, oh, well, you know, I went to cemetery and then got out. And I'm, I'll tell you this about my personal testimony. Um, the old preacher said to me, he said, how long you were a policeman? I said, well, the other departments and all the other times, a little over 20 years, but only 17 with the sheriff's office uh, down here. And he said, you must have been a slow learner. And I said, sir? And he said, it took you over 20 years to graduate from seminary. Meaning that what God put me through yes. was preparation of the vessel. Amen. wasn't something you learn out of a book. It's something you learn through experience. Yes. Amen. Trial and error. I was a petrified vessel. Had it drawn up. We'd finally gotten to the point where if the washing machine busted, I could work a couple hours overtime somewhere and pay for the thing in cash. We were just getting our nose above the water and just about to get the house paid off and just the car was paid off. I mean, man, we're like, we're, we're fixing to get there. We are getting ready to go, quote, full time. And the air conditioner blew up. I mean, blew up, like, like the whole thing. Like, not I can call Brother Brian and get him over there to, you know, put it together and weld it together. Then the hot water blew, heater blew up. And then we had a leak in the slab, underneath the slab. And then the car caught on fire. And then all this, and I'm like, what, what in the world? It wasn't the Lord whipping me. It was just every time I got a little nest egg built up, something happened and that nest egg went. <laughs> when I left, I didn't even, I think I had three days of leave time left. <laughs> I got two more paychecks and I was done. You know what I learned about myself back then? I learned I had gotten custom to the wheel. I had learned that I had already decided for the Lord that I was uh, where I needed to be doing what I needed to do and I don't need to be on the wheel anymore. Just set me over to the side, use me wherever you want to and use me for whatever you want to use me for. And the Lord said, what makes you think I'm done with you, boy? And he put me back on the wheel. And he mashed me. And he made me into something that I never... Do you, you do realize when he called me to pastor, <clears throat> I said, Lord, I know how to be a policeman. I can read that out of a book. I don't know nothing about being a pastor. I can be a preacher, but I don't know nothing about being a pastor. I don't want to be a pastor. After what I saw my daddy go through, I, don't, I know thank you, sir. With all due respect, I'll back up anybody. I don't want to be a pastor. The Lord said, you... That's why if you were brave enough to be here during the early years, I knew how to be a policeman. I'd pick you out of a crowd and call you by name. And it wasn't right. I didn't know any better. I didn't care. I wasn't a pastor. I was a preacher. <laughs> or a headhunter. <laughs> <laughs> hey, brother, you still smoking them cigarettes? You know you need to quit. You know, it's like... 
Hey, you still sleeping in church? You know you need to get a nap. You know, it's like, if you're tired, stand up. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. A pastor? I mean, back in those days, man, I'd preach death in the pot. I'd put all kind of stuff in the pot and leave my britches on and put on a mini skirt. And the Lord said, let your light so shine, not your tail light shine. I mean... <laughs> I put on long hair and a wig. I took her favorite spoon that we used to use as an instrument of correction on the children. And I got carried away and I hit that spoon and that thing broke and I'm like, uh, sorry. <laughs> took one of the favorite teacups and talking about the Lord and along these lines and I hit the thing and I didn't know it was one of those special things that when you hit it it doesn't just like crack it goes in a million pieces it looked like sand fell out of my hand I'm like <laughs> preached the message about driving some a spike through somebody's ear and I took a railroad spike of all things and I put it on the thing there weren't metal over there they're wood and I put it in that casing and I hit it and I split that casing all to pieces people would come in there I kicked the, the, the stupid wall that was up there one time and kicked it over it's like laying over this way like that what happened? I was just the preacher he's preaching a sermon. Knocking holes in Brother Lentz's wall. Ah, just ridiculous stuff. You say, what is that? That's the vessel being marred in the hand of the potter. Making me into something that I didn't want to be. Working on me. Changing me. Fixing me. By the way, he's not done yet. Stand by for heavy rolls. <laughs> <laughs> Working on me. Working on her. Imagine what that might be like. You, you're married to a policeman who's doing pretty good there and then all of a sudden you're a preacher of a Pentecostal snake handling church. <laughs> With a sagging roof. White concrete building. Don't you tell me if anybody's been around here long, you know that's what they thought we did in there. Y'all got the snakes over there? Yeah, they're out back. You know, We just pick them up for the service. <laughs> Shall the clay say unto the potter? Look, if you will, please, in verse number four. Let me hurry. The vessel was made of clay, was marred in the hand of the potter. Like Brother Larry said in his prayer, we've been talking about dirt. They tell me when it comes, Brother Inglesaf's one of the ones that does the pottery thing and so on and so forth, tell me certain kinds of clay are fit and usable for putting on a wheel and making pots and different things out of them and that kind of thing. But, but certain kinds of clay, certain kinds of dirt are not fit to be put on a wheel because they, won't, they don't have any tensile strength or the ability to, to bind together. So you have to realize that until your dirt's ready, even if it's to make a pot, your dirt has to be acceptable to the Lord to reach down there with his nail-pierced hands and grab it up and say, okay, I'm going to use this. The fact that you're even on the wheel is a miracle. The fact that he would care to even put you on the wheel and work on you. And he sets you up there on the wheel and he says, now, can I do what I want to? Well, yes, sir, but I kind of have in mind. It's like my daddy in the haircut I told you about. I kind of have in mind what I think I should look like, Lord. The Lord said, I, I didn't ask you. I said, is it okay? Here's the question. Can I do with you what I want to do with you? Can I make you what I want you to be? It's pleasing to me. Well, yeah, Lord, is, I mean, as long as it kind of, <laughs> if it's kind of close to what I, okay. You say, what's going to happen? You're going to get made and then you're not going to get used the way that you want to be used. I know this about vessels. Tupperware is a great thing to store things in, but you shouldn't be using that in the oven or on the stove. I've learned that. It's not even good to put it in the microwave. But it's great to put it in there. The thing about Tupperware, too, is if you leave something in it too long, it takes on the smell of whatever's in the container. Not the best container. Glass is great, but it's, you, know, you can see through it, and it's a good container, and it doesn't absorb the smells, but it breaks really easy under pressure. Some of it, even if it's tempered glass, it still breaks. You know what? Stainless steel is really, really good. I, I don't mind stainless steel uh, utilizing that. But you don't really store stuff in the refrigerator in stainless steel. And at the same time, you don't take that Tupperware pot and put stuff on the stove. You say, what? There's different vessels for different things. The issue is not how many vessels there are in the house, some to honor, some to dishonor. The issue is, is can God make you whatever vessel He wants you to be? Amen. 
are you that pliable? All throughout the Bible, the Apostle Paul is named Saul, and when Saul was coming along there, you know what the Lord said? I want to find out about your pliability. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Yeah. And Saul was changed to Paul, but it didn't happen overnight. Yeah. It was constant. You ever read 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 or 12? And what Paul went through? You say, what was that? That's the forming of the clay. That's the bearing in your body, the marks of the Lord Jesus. That's his fingerprints on you. That's his hand on you. That's him working on you. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you, are you even on the wheel? Have you subjected yourself to the potter's touch? When was the last time you kind of felt his hand sort of squeeze you and just kind of like, whoa. I mean, when the potter's hand squeezes you until it gets to be a finished work, you know what that does? It stinking hurts. Amen. And he has all kinds of ways of showing you you're not pliable. Those hard spots that are there that he's like, hey, it'll be pleasing to me if you'll get this fixed. Yeah, I ain't doing it. The Lord said, well, then obviously you don't want to be pleasing to me. You've made your mind up the kind of vessel you want to be. A dishonorable vessel is a rebellious vessel. It's already made the choice as to what it's going to be and how it's going to be, not wanting God to even interfere. But I'm going to tell you this in my own personal life, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just telling you that right now I'm going through a metamorphosis. I don't think I'm going to emerge a butterfly. I can't even be honest and tell you I know what the Lord's doing. I know this. He's checking my pliability. You know what I found out right off the bat? When he started squeezing me about four weeks ago, I realized I'd taken myself off the wheel. Yeah. And how dare him think about putting me back up there. I don't... Nothing wrong with me. and constant pressure, and constant pressure, and constant pressure. And the Lord said, uh, boy, I'm not going to do anything with you out there till you get back on the wheel. You want to go and run along? Go ahead. Ruin your life. Scourge you. Whooping you. A lot of those things wouldn't have taken place if I'd have stayed on the wheel. Preacher, you deserve a whooping. Okay. I even have to take that. I even have to take it from you. I can't justify it. Sure I do. If the Lord's given it to me, surely I deserve it. I won't argue with you. I'm not going to say, you deserve one too. Whatever. Here's what I know. I know I had become unpliable in the potter's hands. And you probably couldn't even tell it from the pew. But if God had decided to call me to a mission field or call me to do something else, and He hasn't, but if He had, I wasn't pliable. You know what the Lord's doing? I can tell you now, working through it in my mind and speaking out loud, the Lord's realigning my priorities. It's real easy with all the stuff going on to forget, you know something, one day I'm going to kick off and I'm going to have to face Him at the judgment seat of Christ. And if I don't get my hind end back up on the wheel, then when I get to the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to go, okay, have a seat over there. Let's see how it played out for you. It's time to get my mind back on what's really important. Get my nose in the pages of the book. Get my knees bent and my head bowed. And say, Lord, do what pleaseth thee. That kind of vessel never has to take anything. He's always in a position of receiving. I'll say this about vessels and I'm going to close. Every vessel is made to contain something so that it might give out to others. But the vessel doesn't get to control what gets put in it. Any more than the ground gets to tell the sower what kind of seed ought to be in the ground. But if the master says you need a little vinegar, you need a little oil, you need a little cream, you need a little, you need a plate, put food on it, scrape it, cut it, all that, get it marred, what is that? Gets washed, gets used again. 
If I had sent out a card today and asked each of you what you'd like to be if you were in the master's house, most people picture something that looks good in the china cabinet. Very few of us would want to be the urn that takes out the stuff out of the bathroom or a garbage can. Even fewer probably would want to be a plate to just have stuff put on us all the time. And just be there for the benefit of others and just next time they use you, <laughs> you're getting out of the cabinet and they're just putting food on you. Mess you up and drown you in soap suds. But if it's good, it pleases the Father for you to be that. Would you be willing to be that? Or have you so laid out your entire life that He cannot do with you as it pleases Him? You've got everything laid out. Can He interrupt your plans this morning? I don't know. I know it's a secret. I watched him do it with Moses after 40 years. I watched him do it with Elisha. I watched him all through the Bible. There's, there is a profound amount of people that put themselves on the wheel and the Lord said, okay, I see what you were doing. Will you do this for me? Well, Lord, I, that's a little out of my skill range. Okay, I'll teach you. you willing to make a fool of yourself for me? Now there's a warning if you don't do that. It's around verse 6 or 7 that's there. And I don't want to get into all that kind of stuff because I don't want you to feel like there's going to be a, a, a pressure on you to do it or God's going to whoop you. The return will come at the judgment seat of Christ. If you don't do what He wants you to do now, that's okay. But when you come up there and expect a reward, you won't get what you were thinking you were going to get because you weren't doing what He told you to do. Now I'm going to ask you with heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to ask you, can the potter do with you what he wants to do? Can the potter make you what he wants you to be? Is your life one husband, wife, mother, father, children? Everybody that's in here that's saved. And is your life one that is pleasing to the potter? while he's working on you those nail scarred hands driving those thumbs and fingers into your sides scarring and marring your image your reputation what it is you want to be for his glory why I'm describing what happened to Jesus Christ the king of glory he came down here and his visage was marred more than any man he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and became a servant and learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy be done. I'm on the wheel, Father. Do with me as it pleases thee, Father. Not my will, Father, but thine be done. Make me into what you want me to be. Peter, that's pretty tough. I, it is. I, it really is tough. I know that. It's, it's scary. It, it's, it's hard. I'm not making light of it. This is a mature audience's only thing. This takes Christianity to a whole nother level. This is so far and beyond most things that go on. It's like, Lord, I, I realize I've started worrying so much about other people and other things and other stuff and the list is a nine miles long. I quit asking you, am I what you want me to be? I don't know, ma'am. Are you? I don't know, sir. Are you? I don't know, Christian. Are you? I don't, I don't know. I can't answer that. I'm in the perfect will of good. Well, praise the Lord. You're in perfect will of God. That's wonderful. But if today, he just supposed today, he said to you, hey, would you preach? Well, well preacher, I'm, I'm too young to be a preacher. I didn't, I didn't say, would you preach now? Would you take the call now? Yeah, but preacher, if I do that, it's going to change my entire life and what I got planned for life. And I'll tell you what, if he'll call me a little later on after I've had some time and some fun and so on and so forth, I mean, how about them? Okay. And before long, you'll be petrified. 
And before long, that call will get silent. And before long, it's not, you didn't do anything wrong. You're just busy. You're unsurrendered anymore. You don't need that old-fashioned stuff anymore. And then before long, you realize, you know something, it's been a while since the Lord spoke to me. And Potter says to the clay, can I not do with you as I will? I'm the one that dug you out of the ground. I'm the one that made you. Can I do with you what I want to do with you? He's asking that as a question. He's not being rhetorical. He's saying, can I? Will you let me? He will not force you. That's the wildest thing in the world. He will not force you to submit. He'll let you run until you ruin it. And don't think you'll always make it back. You may not. You'll still be saved. And still home in glory, Father.